We are live. Welcome everyone to this panel that we, uh, uh, myself and Paloma Esquivel, the co-chairs of the, La the Latino Caucus for the Los Angeles Times, and part of the Los Angeles Times Guild, are going to be hosting. So we're just going to vamp a little bit for a couple of minutes, let people start coming in, but we're going to talk basically about one year into the Latino Caucus at the Times. What, what led to its creation? What did we hope to accomplish? What have we accomplished? And what are we doing moving forward, especially right now at a time where, hey, we all got a new editor, Kevin Merida, uh, and at a time, of course, when, as we all know, the newspaper industry is never boring. So, uh, you know, let's preview our talk, Paloma. So what are we going to be talking about? Hi, first off, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Paloma Esquivel. I'm a reporter, an education reporter at the LA Times, and I'm really excited to be here. Um, yeah, we're going to be talking about First of all, you know, we wanted to give a little bit of history of the, the caucus. How is it that we got to the point where we felt we needed to, to make a, a Latino caucus? And what were the things that we were trying to accomplish? And sort of where things um, have gone since last last summer when we initially formed. So, so that's kind of what we're going to be going through. Um, and yeah, I'm really excited to talk to everybody about this. And just a quick uh, side note, many of our other colleagues are also speaking at this conference as well. Fidel Martinez, he's talking about his newsletter, The Latinx Files. Uh, Osp, like, if you're not subscribed to it already, subscribe to it. Uh, Susie Exposito from uh, Entertainment, she's talking on a panel as well. So many of us at the LA Times are represented here. And also just check out as many of these panels as possible. I mean, it's great to see so much interest in Latino media in Latino reporters who happen to be in the media, in all of that. So, and if you're one of those, hey, welcome, hi, nice seeing you. Uh, if you want to talk to us afterwards, you know, after our panel is done, our emails, or our emails are easy to remember, gustavo.ariano at latimes.com, paloma.esquivel at latimes.com, follow us on Twitter, all of that stuff. So I think we got a good crowd, maybe just a little bit, one more minute. We'll start at 104, then we'll start at that. Um, Paloma, just in case, she's too she's too humble to say, but she got uh, announced today as an investigation investigative reporter for education. So promotion, it's so awesome. Paloma's background, uh, she was one of the team for the Bell scandal. If, if people remember something about the LA Times in the past decade, it's definitely been, was the Bell scandal that just exposed widespread corruption, this small working class Latino city in Southeast LA. So, I mean, she's awesome. She's awesome and so, so cool to see her getting promoted. About time, you know? <laughs> Thank you for that. Of course, siempre. So, okay, I think we should start. So, welcome everyone. I am Gustavo Arellano. I'm a columnist for the Los Angeles Times. I'm also the host of the new daily podcast for the Times called The Times Daily News from the LA Times. And on behalf of the Latino Caucus, I'm a co-chair and so is my co-host here, Paloma Esquivel. We want to welcome you. This panel is going to be talking about, there's an official title which Paloma put up. It's going to be a PowerPoint, but we're going to talk over it. But it's going to be talking about the Latino caucus, who we are, why we started, why it started in the paper that we belong to, the Los Angeles Times, sort of the unique circumstances that led to it. Also, what happened in the past year that really led to something that has created. Um, what do what do we do within the caucus? What do we do outside of the caucus? And where do we see ourselves really in this uh, galaxy of Latinos in media? at a time where we're all trying to push for more representation, but also frankly, more, more equity, more, um, just more opportunities for those of us who are already here and create more spaces for those who are not. So Paloma, uh, you wanna say any quick words before we put up our, our uh, awesome presentation? Yeah, I would just say um, I made a PowerPoint because otherwise I, I just ramble. So I like to well, have things I organized. ramble more than you, so you're great. Um, but yeah, I would just say like, you know, one thing I said when we started our campaign and when we started the group is that I've, I've been at the LA Times for 14 years now and starting the group and doing the campaign that we did really was one of the proudest moments that I've had at the LA Times because of how much, you know, it just meant so much to me to have all of the Latino staffers coming together in this community in LA, you know, that's half Latino um, and demanding better for, for ourselves as employees of the LA Times, for future employees of the LA Times, um, and also for our community. 
Um, so it, that was just a really, really proud moment. And so I'm really excited to be able to share with everybody a little bit about that. Um, let me go ahead and open this up and hopefully this works. Mm -hmm. uh, and we see a chat here. So like Diane Salis says, congrats, Paloma. Daniela Garzón uh, also says Paloma you. is a serious rock star from uh, Prof. Prof. Cal State University, Northridge. So if you have any uh, comments or whatever, I'll just read them as we go. But okay, cool. We got this up. Awesome. All right. Um, this is our hashtag, Somos LAT, which we use for, for everything we do. Um, Gustavo, do you want to start off with a little bit of uh, walking us through kind of the history of, of Latinos in the LA Times? Absolutely. So I, you know, Paloma's been at the Times for a while. I've only been there about, eh, about two and a half years. So I'm still a relative newcomer. But as a reporter, as a Southern, as a, you know, native of Southern California, and as a nerd, I've long read the Los Angeles Times. And the more you read it, especially the backstory, uh, we were not a good paper for a long time. In fact, we were probably one of the most racist papers in the United States at the same time that we were one of the most powerful newspapers in the United States. And the onus of our racism really fell hard on Latinos. So you see, uh, last year, and we're going to talk a little bit about this because uh, this actually goes along with the creation of the Latino caucus. I was asked to do a retrospective about the history of Latinos in the LA Times and also the history of how Latinos covered the Los Angeles Times. And as I said earlier, it was ugly and here's proof. We have some headlines just from, uh, from the past. You see a small one right there that literally says, watch the dirty Mexican newspaper in this town. They ought to be suppressed like the Seattle record. That was from the op-ed pages in 1918. The newspaper that was being criticized was a Spanish language newspaper that was just saying that, hey, that the, uh, the American intervention in Mexico should not be happening anymore. And when the LA Times said they ought to be suppressed like the Seattle Record, well, the Seattle Record was a labor newspaper in Seattle in 1918 that was violently suppressed by the American government at the time during the big uh, port strike that they had in 1918. So essentially what the LA Times is advocating for was the removal, uh, you know, the the, clo the closure of a newspaper because it dared criticize imperialism. And, and imperialism, by the way, that was uh, applauded by the LA Times because the Chandler family that owned the LA Times owned uh, over a million acres of land in Mexico. Some other headlines from the past. U.S. increases guard against wetback cord. That's from the 1950s. This, uh, you know, zoot suitors learn lessons and fight with servicemen. This is the month of, you know, the anniversary of the zoot suit rights. I actually think it's next Monday, this coming Monday. So that one, the LA Times whipped up an entire um, uh, persecution campaign and a denigration campaign a young, against young Mexican-American men and women because they wore the zoot suit during World War II and labeled them pachucos. Um, you also see there, this one's really ugly. Uh, you just read it right there. Illegal aliens are winning beachhead for third world. Problematic much? Not during the 1970s. This actually led a big series in the late 70s that the LA Times did about undocumented immigrants coming to Southern California. And if you know your history in the late 70s, it's going to be a lot of Central American refugees, a lot of Mexicanos as well. And that's what we're reduced to. Our communities are reduced to that. That's what the LA Times did. And then I, you, I think you have it blocked mostly there, Paloma, but it says Pete Wilson for governor. Um, there's like a little button there, the bottom. But I'll, I'll read it. Don't worry about it, Paloma. But it says <laughs> Pete Wilson for governor, the best choice. Uh, something like that. But as you, if you know your history, of course, Pete Wilson was a governor of California in 1994. He won re-election in an upset victory because he latched onto... Um, here in California, we have the proposition system, which basically you could put anything on the ballot if you get enough signatures and it becomes California law. Well, in 1994, you had something called Prop 187, which sought to make life miserable for undocumented immigrants. We did a whole podcast series about the uh, the legacy of Prop 187. The reason California has so many powerful Latino politicians now, like U.S. Senator Alex Padilla, was because it was a generation inspired by you know, just, you know, inspired by the xenophobia of people like Pete Wilson. So what did the LA Times do? We endorsed Pete Wilson. So we've been living down that legacy still to this day. So if you can move to the next slide, Paloma, please. That said, even as we had this horrible legacy of covering Latinos, there were Latinos within the newsroom 
that were pushing. And, I, and we're still learning this history, by the way, at the Latino Caucus. Uh, you know, as we go through archives, we're learning about Latino uh, uh, cartoonists that were in drawing for the LA Times as early as the 1920s. You have reporters uh, joining in and editors in the 1950s. Of course, you have the martyr, Ruben Salazar, who came originally from El Paso, uh, became uh, then worked up for a little bit in Santa Rosa before landing at the LA Times in the early 1960s. He literally created the genre of Latino journalism in English language newspapers. I, there's a collection of him that was, um, it was called Border Correspondent. It was released by uh, University of California Press in the 90s. And then there was a reissue in the last decade, I believe. And you see the collection of him. So Ruben started as a reporter, then ended up becoming a columnist. He's most remembered now as a columnist, but he was a columnist for less than a year. And you read his reporting, he was... He was just a great reporter, period. But the fact that he was creating this whole genre on his own just made him a pioneer. And of course, he was tragically killed during the Chicano moratorium, which was a big it was a big protest against the Vietnam War by Chicanos in East L.A. Uh, he was killed by an L.A. sheriff's deputy tear gas canister, which struck him in the head and killed him immediately. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. In the 1980s, we had a Pulitzer Prize winning series. Uh, it was a 24 part F a package of stories talking about the Latino community done by Latino editors, by Latino photographers, by Latino reporters. And even then it was still not uh, supported fully by the Latino, uh, by the rest of the newspaper. Infamously, uh, someone told the editor, uh, one of the editors of the package, Frank Sotomayor, oh, how are you gonna do this, uh, this package with, with spray can, like with graffiti? So even as even as Latinos have long faced racism and they, these are the two most prominent like examples. But in the 90s, there was an initiative to try to bring more Latinos. So you had Latino reporters trying to fight the good fight, but ultimately getting stymied by management, by ownership, leaving leading to a lot of just, you know, just bad ghosts, frankly, bad, bad, just bad memories of that. And we still have some reporters, by the way, from the Latino series who can tell more about that. And then along comes our generation, us mid, you know, mid-career journalists were called Paloma, myself, Ruben Vives, Hector Becerra, and others. And then that leads to what happened next, uh, last year. Paloma, I'll take it away now. Yeah, so that, you know, I think that's, that perfectly brings us up to the present. And actually, Gustavo was talking about the efforts that previous generations of Latino journalists uh, made to really try to change the situation at the paper. Um, I was recently reading a memo that one of our former uh, Latino managers at the paper wrote, I think it was like in 2000 or the early 2000s. Um, and it was a, a memo to the editor in chief at the time saying, you know, Latinos only make up 8% of the newsroom. What are we going to do? We have to do something to address this. We have to change this. Um, and yet we got to the summer of 2020 and this is basically where we, we, where we were at the numbers here. So LA County is 49% Latino. LA city is 49% Latino. These are, you know, well, we are Latino communities and the newsroom in the summer of 2020 for the LA Times was 13% Latino um, among editors and managers that that number was 11%. Um, so, so despite those efforts by Latino journalists to always bring in new generations and to always push, you know, we, we really had not made uh, much ground, you know, compared to, to, uh, who we are in this community. And is so I think that when we um, when we got to that, the, that summer where there was so much upheaval and so much of a reckoning across the country, right, um, about changing these things, um, you know, it, it was sort of imperative that, that we had to do something. And one thing I wanna point out is that we as a caucus owe our existence to um, our colleagues who came together before us and formed the Black Caucus. Um, if you look at the numbers for Latino journalists at the LA Times, they're terrible. The numbers for Black uh, reporters and journalists are, are far worse. Um, and so our, our colleagues came together, they formed the Black Caucus and they decided um, that they were going to make a list of demands to our owner uh, for change, you know, and you can read some of this, um, uh, this powerful letter that they that they wrote 
Um, and they made a list of demands that included um, committing to hiring enough black journalists to reflect the percentage of black residents in LA County, um, to create a pipeline for black journalists to advance in their careers, um, for a public apology from the LA Times for the way that it has covered black communities and communities of color historically, um, to correct pay disparities, which are so just absolutely prevalent in our industry um, and in so many industries. Um, to hire and uh, to hire someone to support the paper's equity and inclusion efforts, to reshape coverage to better reach people of color. Um, and to this is a, a at the time we were all on uh, work furloughs, and so they asked for a commitment to end those as well as um, not having any cuts to staff and to require uh, managers to meet one-on-one -on -one with all the black journalists on staff uh, to hear their stories. Um, and, and this was just, and, and they paired this with um, a social media campaign, excuse me, um, they paired it with a social media campaign in which former black staffers at the LA Times um, who had left the paper told their stories and told their experiences um, at the paper. And, and that was something that frankly was was just embarrassing and, and really sad. Um, the racism that, the outright racism really that, that a lot of uh, former black staffers had, had faced at the paper. And I think that, that that effort and that willingness to be public about those things really, really changed the game um, for the paper and really made a lot of, of staffers realize that, that we just had to, we had to change the way we were doing things. Um, and so, yeah. Okay, yeah, now Baloma and I were going every other, every, we each get two slides in a row. I just want to point something out also with the figures about uh, the Latino, the, the newsroom uh, with Latino representation. We're actually better than most of the industry in it. Like maybe the Miami, the Miami Herald has more percentage of Latinos in the newsroom, but we're better than New York Times. We're better than Washington Post. We're better than USA Today. We're better than most Latino, uh, you know, a majority like of the big papers in the country. And it, and our numbers are atrocious. Our, our numbers are completely, absolutely atrocious. And that our numbers are good within the industry just shows how far we still have to go. It's, it's an embarrassment. So. Seeing our, you know, our black colleagues, them forming the caucus, also, you know, where we're all going through this racial reckoning and also what was going on at the LA Times, which you'll see some figures now, that's when, uh, you know, our group got together. We, you know, it was, uh, I first heard it from Paloma and also Fidel Martinez from Latinx Files, Esmeralda Bermudez, of course, uh, awesome reporter. And then you just start hearing like, hey, you know, there's this uh, caucus coming along, like, uh, do you want to join a part of it? And almost exclusively, all, I think we have 65 members, which represents almost the entirety of Latinos at the times, not just writers themselves, but copy editors, designers, photographers, oh, I think the one photographer, the one Latino photographer we have, uh, associate editors, basically members of the LA Times Guild, our union, it was immediate. And so we came together, I, I wrote about this, I'll never forget our first meeting, you have you just see the diversity of faces. And remember, this is at the height of shutdowns. We haven't seen each other in person in months. So to see the entirety of Latinidad, black, brown faces, all the spectrums of the rainbow, you know, Caribbean, South American, Chicano, Pocho, Mexicano, Central American, old, young. It was really, really inspiring. And look, I'm a cynical person. And I was, at first I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'll join it. But just seeing them like, okay, that we're here and you see all these faces are, yeah, you know, on one hand, yes, we like, we're upset about the disparities, but like, we want to work towards it. So we formed the caucus and you hear, you, you know, you see some of these demands that we had and also just sort of a, como se dice, a mission statement in a way. For much of its history, the Los Angeles Times has covered the Latino community in dehumanizing ways. Today, the, time, the Times continues to fail in its staffing and coverage to reflect a region where nearly one out of every two residents is Latinos. So some of the demands that we had hold, account, hold managers accountable for their track records of recruiting and retaining journalists of color because the LA Times has a very bad track record of keeping Latinas and Latinos in the newsroom. I mean, and just especially uh, reporters are co of color. We're notorious for that, sadly. Uh, usually if you leave the Times, you go on to win a Pulitzer, which, uh, like, we lose that. It's, it's terrible. Apologize for fomenting episodes of anti-Latino hysteria with 
which Dr. Patrick Soon Xiang, our our owner, he did, uh, and not just apologize for Latinos, but also the atrocious records of covering age, like all uh, people of color, and just some of these a robust pop pipeline for Latino talent, and more and more and more. So if you could go to the next slide, Paloma. <coughs> and so part of the. You know, again, and the very first demand, or not demand, but statement, by the way, was we stand in, we were inspired by, as Paloma said, we were inspired by, and we stand in solidarity, in, sorry, in solidarity with the Latino caucus. Their fight is our fight, and we will always be with them 100%. And also, I cannot, I cannot overstate the inspiration. They were the ones who were courageous enough to create this. We follow in their wake. We owe everything to them. And part of that was doing this campaign. So we decided to do our own Twitter campaign. With that hashtag, Somos LA Times, you, we have our Twitter account, so please follow us. Uh, we try to, we'll get to that a little bit, but we just try to tweet out all the stories that all of our members do, which can be hard because we do so many stories. Um, but we pinned it. You saw it right there. That was sort of, I mean, you see again, that amazing, beautiful panel of Latinidad right there. Those are our members right there. Like, all, like I just seeing it right there, all sorts of just one. It's, to me, it just inspires me so much. It's a, it's, for me, it's like, this is why we got into newspapers to increase our numbers. And this is who we are all coming from different walks of life, but all together on this. And yeah, that was a pin tweet to this day. It'll be up there and yeah, follow us, please. So Paloma. Okay. Yeah. And I just want to share like some of the things, essentially what our initial campaign was, was that letter that we wrote to our owner um, as well as the list of demands. And then our social media com campaign was basically focused on, um, you know, tweeting out a list of facts about the LA Times and, and did you know, you know, did you know sort of the, the situation when it comes to Latinos at the LA Times? Um, so this is one out of, uh, only 12 out of 109 LA Times editors and managers are Latino. Um, the LA Times has zero Latino reporters on its investigations team. That by the way is still true, even though uh, there have been a couple of us considered investigative reporters. Um, as part of our official investigations team at the paper, there are still zero Latinos uh, on that team. And, uh, and yeah, and it was painful. It's painful, yes, to go against your own um, paper, your own bosses, but you have to do it. You have to do it. They, sometimes you have to publicly shame your bosses because they need to feel the wrath. And the great thing about this campaign, and here, yeah, here's another one during the LA Times recent hiring spree. So this is from 2020. Of 168 people that we hired, only 29 Latinos were brought in as part of that. Think about that with the stats before. If, if uh, Southern California, Los Angeles is 50% Latino, 29 out of 168 is not even 25. It's not even a quarter. It's not even, I mean, I'm bad at math, but that those numbers are absolutely atrocious. And the, the, the public reacted and responded and they supported us. And, and this is what we were telling people was, we still want you to read the Times. We want you to subscribe to the Times. I mean, th that's how we have our jobs, you know. They need to feel the wrath. Exactly, Graciela. They do need to feel the wrath. Más que todo, tienen que tener vergüenza. You know, they need to feel shame that the numbers are the way that we are. And so it was heartening to see so much support from our uh, from our readers, especially Latinos, not just in Southern California, but we have subscribers from across the United States telling the Times, we love, you know, Paloma's stories are awesome. Ruben Vives is great. Uh, Brittany Mejia's stories are amazing. And what a shame that there's not more support for them. And so that obviously resonated all the way through our paper. And then we had this response from Dr. Patrick Soon Chong, and you see it right there. Our staff makeup and coverage should better reflect the fact that one in two Latinos in LA County is Latino, or one in two people in LA County is Latino. They should go without saying. And so his promises are there: expand coverage of the Latino community. He he did the institutional apology, trying to strengthen the procedures. A lot of this is work in progress, and we gave him like five years, which is a long time. We're already in year one, and. We understand there are, of course, issues with budgets and all that. On one hand, we understand that. On the other hand, though, a promise is a promise. And if you and, and our big argument is not just that it's right to have a diverse newsroom, but if you want to play the dollars and cents game, come on, it makes financial sense. If you're, if how could you be only thirteen plus thirteen percent Latino in an area that's fifty percent in an industry 
in a, in a country where Latinos are thirsting for stories about themselves across the industry, across different mediums. I mean, you have an untapped market that's still there despite all the efforts of so many other publications. I mean, we have a we have a huge head start, and if we don't use that head start and build on that, then we're just going to be, to use that cliche, um, spinning our wheels. And after a while, those wheel those wheels spin off. Yeah. Um, so, and you know, one thing like we talked about earlier is that we um, are very aware of the history of Latino staffers who have come to the paper, who have um, worked for for increased representation. And then, you know, and uh, managers or, or leaders will say, okay, we agree, let's do it. They'll do something for a couple of years and then that's the end of it. <laughs> and then we're back where we started. Um, and so once we did that campaign, once we got those promises from Dr. Soon Shang, you know, I think that for a lot of us, it was extremely important to keep going, you know, that we continue with the caucus that we continue to exist as a group that's going to put um, pressure on the company where needed, but also that's going to continue as a group that's going to lift up the work of uh, Latino journalists and that's going to connect with the the next generation of Latino journalists. So you know, so since then we have done a number of campaigns. Um, in uh, August of of last year, we did just a day of of sort of remembering and lifting up the memory of Ruben Salazar, who, who um, Gustavo talked about earlier, who's such an important uh, person for, for Latinos at the time. It's, and so we just really wanted to, to take a moment and, and lift him up and, and make sure that people know his name and, and remember that history. Um, we've also used our Twitter account. I mean, this is really Gustavo's work every day is, is posting about the stories that our Latino staffers are doing. Um, so that we are are lifting up uh, our staffers, so that we're we're lifting up their stories and and recognizing them every day. Um, we also held an open house for college students in February, where a bunch of our staffers um, uh, talked, you know, about the work they do, answered questions, and we had a really great showing for that. You know, there was a lot of there's a lot of, of hunger from from young journalists who who want to hear about. Um, our work and, and what we do and about the LA Times. So that was a really awesome um, event. Um, and then uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about just some of the changes that we've seen at the, the LA Times. Um, you know, a lot of these things I, I want to mention are like ideas that our staffers had for years <laughs> and were pitching for years. And the difference that the caucus made was that sort of a light bulb went off, you know, for our managers to say, oh, yes, there's an imperative here. We have to do these things and we have to start approving them. So um, Fidel Martinez started the Latinx files, which I just hope if you're not subscribed to it, please subscribe. He's such a powerful and and just wonderful writer and has um, is just telling these really great stories and also um bringing together a lot of a lot of different stories from different uh, publications. So that's a really great resource. Um, we asked one of our demands was for a Latino columnist because we didn't have one other than our sports columnist. Um, we didn't have one covering uh, uh, Metro. And so Gustavo is, is our wonderful uh, Metro columnist. Um, and we also uh, have now Carolina Miranda uh, who's an arts and entertainment columnist. And the, I mean, the types of stories they're telling, you can just see there and you can look at their work. They're, they're so important to our community. They're, they're so, so important. Um, another thing that just launched um, is our Latino Life page. Um, so this is a page where you can go and just see all of the Latino stories that our staffers are telling. It's really, really incredible. It's sort of like we, we could be a publication on our own with all these <laughs> incredible <laughs> stories that we're telling. So that's definitely something else to check out. And then the Times podcast, which is not uh, a Latino podcast, right? But it's a daily podcast hosted by Gustavo. Um, so it's another incredible opportunity for, for Latino staffers. So I, I think it's important to recognize that there have been significant changes in the wake of, of the caucus that really just have to do with like opening up 
the possibilities for our staffers who already had these ideas, who already wanted to do this work. Um, it's just a matter of like the company deciding, yes, now we prioritize these things. Um, but um, I, you know, I also wanted to not to end on a, a down note, but I think it, it's important to acknowledge that we have a lot of work left to do. Um, so uh, this is from a company presentation earlier this year. Um, in 2020, Latinos were 16% of job applicants in, in the LA Times editorial um, and 12.5% of hires. So, you know, what we had asked for is for Latinos to make up 25% of the newsroom uh, within five years. And if this continues to be the case, we won't get there. Um, so we are continuing to push. We have um, folks who, uh, uh, we have three uh, members of the Latino caucus who are considered like our jobs liaisons. Um, they are constantly like looking for Latino talent and letting the, the company know about Latino talent that's out there. Um, so, you know, we're trying to help change these things. Um, and I do believe that, that the company is also trying to change these things, but there's a lot of, a lot of work left to do. Yeah. Again, like we're all, we're all happy to be at the times, honestly, in terms of like, we, we understand our mission. We want to do jobs. The fact that we do have these responsibilities or, you know, we have this platform, we don't take it for granted, but because of that, that's why we have been pushing and we will continue to push because it's important that, it, it, again, th honestly, it's just, if you want, if we want to have a feature at this paper, then this paper needs to look more like the community that it covers. And we are, you know, LA is like a, the gateway to, just like Miami, you know, we're, we're, we're both gateways to Latin America coming from different uh, avenues, but we're also the gateway to Asia. We're the gateway to so much. And we're in California, you know, we're always supposed to be the feature in California, but we, you know, we just got a new editor. I think I said that at the top, Kevin Merida. So far, we like what he has to say. And we know that, I mean, he created uh, or saved basically a website from certain extinction, the Undefeated, which focused on the Black experience with through the lens of ESPN and did a great job at that. So we look forward to working along with them, but we're not going to give them a pass. We are going to be like, hey, Kevin, that's awesome you're here. By the way, this is the city that you're in now. This is what our newsroom looks like. Let's talk. Let's. And then there's so many talented Latino reporters out there right now. There's so many talented Latino reporters and, you know, Latinx uh, in, the, in colleges, smaller newspapers. We want to be a home for them. And, uh, but we cannot, we do not want to bring them in to a home where it's going to be problems for new hires, you know, and that, a lot of work to be done, but we, uh, we're guardedly optimistic, but uh forever vigilance let's let's put it let's leave it at that so yeah if you have any questions right now please leave them in the comments and Gra graciela asked one right now uh, and she asked do you see the caucus and your impact as a model for other newsrooms do you see this kind of change happening in other newsrooms so paloma if you could actually talk about uh a meeting we had with the paper i don't know if you want to name them or not but we could talk about it um yeah we did have i'll just say that uh, uh another large newspaper, we had a, a meeting with a group um, that is forming their own caucus um, and wanted to hear more about how we went about doing things and just to get advice. And yeah, I mean, you know, every newsroom is unique, but I just can't say enough about what a difference it made to just get together and talk about our concerns, talk about our experiences um, and just have that unity because, you know, a lot of times, and I think this is true of a lot of newsrooms, if you're a Latino on staff, you're maybe the only one in your in your department or maybe one of a couple in your department, you know? So there's that sense of like isolation um, and just getting together and being able to like share your experiences, um, share what you're seeing, share what you're feeling. It makes a huge difference. So, you know, I, I don't know if every newsroom is is ready to go out sort of publicly and uh, lambast their their uh, management for the way they've, they've been doing things. Um, I hope more more will, because I do think it's, it's important. But but even just having that group to, to get together and connect is is super important, I think. What do you think, Gustavo? No, absolutely. And it's uh, the LA Times is a unique example because, let's face it, the how the American media has covered Latinos in Latin America 
has never been good, at least historically horrible. But the LA Times was like 30 times worse than any other examples you could bring. I mean, seriously, read the history that I wrote, not just for shameless self-promotion, but just to be disgusted at how bad the Times was. So it was important that we take the stand. And that said, though, Latinos across the, com across the industry, you, you all come from communities that have your own unique circumstances, that have your own historical sins committed by your paper. I would advise, we would advise all of you to create that, you know, to create a caucus, to create even, you know, we're unionized and we technically call ourselves a caucus, but also just to create a group. It helps us support. And, you know, again, we did this during the pandemic. We can't, we haven't really seen, seen each other in person. I was able to see Paloma because we did, you know, we mailed out some books along with a couple of other members. And this is before like things got, were even, things were, you know, it was starting to get better with the coronavirus pandemic, but not to the point we're at now in California. But we haven't even held a mixer. I can't wait to have a mixer so we can see each other all in person and just be there. You know, the the people who have more years serve as mentor for mentors for the younger folks. And just a reminder for all of us, we're here as a resource for ourselves. We're here to be um, held accountable by the community. And of course, the community is not always going to like what we have to report, but at the very least, know to the community, like we're here, we understand your concerns about equity, about the uh, diversity and stories. And then as here, as como se dice, as a collective to be able to then pressure our management to do better by all of us combined. So, so I, you know, if, if any of you are with any organizations that want to do something like this, have your own caucus, please reach out to Paloma, myself, and I have to say at the end, after we talked to the, the, the Latinos at this newspaper, they, we heard back and they're like, they were really excited. They were really excited and they want to do something. And so we can't wait for them to hopefully do something, then announce it publicly and then just congratulate them publicly and do that. So more, I'll, I'll read the questions, Paloma. Roberto Peixoto, I hope I pronounced your last name correctly. Uh, what advice would you give for those wanting to implement this model in medium and small newsrooms? Again, just start with a couple of people. And, and by the way, not everyone's gonna be interested in it and that's okay. I think in our case, almost everyone in the, all Latinos in the newsroom are members of the caucus. Not all of them, though, participate. They just are there. They, you know, they join. They want to say we stand in solidarity, but we're off doing our things. That's okay. You know, I think everyone who's interested in doing a caucus is going to have their own role to play in it and let them play their role. At some point, maybe if they'll find the calling to step up like myself, <laughs> I never imagined in a million years I would belong to a caucus, let alone be the co-chair. But when I was asked, it just felt right for me to do. And, you know, and Paloma, again, you know, Paloma was there from the start. So it made sense that Paloma would be there. But, you know, just for me, once I was asked, I'm like, you know what? This feels like the right thing to do. And, you know, I'm not going to be co-chair. We're not going to be co-chairs forever um, because also it's important to rotate, I think, leadership. But I definitely want to be involved in whatever way I possibly can. Uh, next question from Laura Rodriguez asks, how can we push for this type of coverage, representation, respect in other newsrooms? Chicago has a large Latino population, and despite some tries, we haven't been successful. As Paloma mentioned, there's very few Latinos in the newsroom. So Paloma, uh, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do think it's, it's tough. And I think that one thing, despite the low numbers at the LA Times, one thing that makes us lucky is that, you know, when you count us all up together, it is dozens. And so it, it makes an impact when we go out sort of publicly. The other thing that has benefited us is um, the guild. You know, we, we exist as part of a guild and there's some protection there um, in terms of being able to speak up and say the things that we want to say. Um, and so those have, those things have made a difference. Um, you know, one thing I hope is that I hope that, this is a model for other newsrooms and that other newsrooms do start doing this at whatever level that they can do it. So maybe it's like you get together with a, a group of Latinos at your paper, you come up with a list of, of issues, concerns that you want to present to management and you do that um, in the form of a letter or you do that in, you know, sort of a, in, in a meeting and you just start raising these concerns as a group. And then hopefully if there are more of these groups around the country, we can support each other, right? I really hope like anybody hearing this who wants to, who's interested in, in forming a caucus, like reach out to us and we'll you know, try to put you in touch also and, and keep in touch with other groups that are doing it so that we can support each other um, 
as we do it, you know, cause it, it's tough, you know, it, it's tough. If you have, it's lonely. Yes. <laughs> it's lonely. Um, but, but I, I do think there, there are things that we can do and, and, and however we can be of support for those things that, you know, we're here. Mireya Navarro. Hey, Mireya, how's it going? Uh, says, Kevin is the best, a fellow graduate of the summer program for minority journalists at UC Berkeley. We were taught by the likes of Frank Sotomayor and Frank Del Olmo, not to mention Bob Maynard and Nancy Hicks, all LA Times alum. Uh, alumni, best of luck. Latino Caucus, thank you, M M Mireya. Cheryl Thompson Morton asks, have you found that creating the solidarity has reduced the amount of retaliation you your members or journalists of color in general have experience when bringing up equity issues. Hmm. I, I mean, yes and no, we obviously we can't speak about all the issues at hand, but I will say this, that management knows that the caucus exists. And when, when Paloma and I are asking for a meeting, they're like, uh oh, what are they going to come with? Because they know we're not necessarily, we're not going to stand with management uh, most 99% of the time. And we're going to be standing, I mean, not, not even that, 100% of the time, we're going to be standing for our members one way or another, even if it goes against our own personal interests. Because that's what a caucus does. A caucus is looking out for their members. A caucus is, a caucus has to look out, I would argue, for who belongs to the membership, but also having to look for the future. Because at the end, it's not, it's not just about who's the members, it's who's going to come in the future. I mean, again, we're following in the legacy of our predecessors like Frank Sotomayor and Frank Del Olmo and Ruben Salazar, some who quietly, others who more uh, explicitly were fighting for more representation and to make the crap that they had to deal with, not have the other, the people who followed them not having to deal with it uh, as much or ever again. So I hope that management uh, treats our, uh, our members more uh, better because they don't want to feel the wrath of the Latino caucus. I think we are. Yeah, I, th I think it has made a difference in having just it's it's we're a group that you can go to if you feel like you're vulnerable. Right. Or if there's a few people in the newsroom who feel like they're vulnerable, vulnerable and that um, management is not treating them fairly. Like, I think we've tried to be a group that will go to the managers and, and be that voice for them so they don't have to do it so much on their own. And I do think that that, that makes a difference. You know, it's really hard when you're an individual, especially if you're a young, uh, you know, just starting in, in your career journalist, like it's really hard to go and, and, and speak up to management. So just to have a group that can kind of do those things, you know, help do those things. I do think it makes a difference. Yesenia de Moya Correa asks in Espanol, ¿Cuál es con ¿Cuáles consejos tienen para period, periodistas latinos que están luchando en organización con otros grupo, grupos racialados, pero que su experiencia es única y que pujan casi a solas en sus redacciones mainstream? What do you say, Paloma? Um, no sé. Es, es difícil cuando, cuando este cuando alguien está tratando de hacer esta lucha a solas es es, es muy difícil, no sé, y, y por eso es, es, es que estoy diciendo que me encantaría que, que hubiera más grupos como el nuestro eh, para hacer este trabajo y, y tal vez tal vez lo que se puede hacer es, es conectar con otras personas eh, aunque no estén en, en tu este eh, tu periódico, tu, eh, eh, tu compañía, que, que tal vez intentes conectarte con otras personas que están es, haciendo esta lucha para ver qué podemos hacer juntos, porque, porque esa es la clave, creo, hacerlo juntos, ¿no? Sí, también, también en tu organización no, es importante no nomás trabajar entre tu, entre tu grupo. Como nosotros empezamos por el Black Caucus, y el Black Caucus no hicieron lo que ellos hicieron, no sé si existiéramos. Y entonces ya ahorita también tenemos nuestros uh, colegas uh, asiáticos, que Asian Americans, que también poco a poco tienen sus propias luchas y nosotros estamos en, sol en solidaridad con ellos. Es, es importante que, eh, yo pienso que es importante que mirar, especialmente nosotros periodistas que somos, miro, bueno, antes éramos minorities, ya no, que nuestra lucha es la lucha de otra gente y 
solos va a ser muy difícil. Entonces no se puede luchar solo, se tiene que luchar con la, toda la gente posible. Y también va a haber anglosajones que van a estar en, en solidarity con ustedes también. Y es importante agarrar esas alianzas con la gente que le importa tu causa siempre. Um, gracias por, por su pregunta. Jessica Retis, hopefully I pronounced your name right. As a former journalism educator who worked for 11 years at Cal State University Northridge, I was wondering if you could please reflect about the educational pipeline. What message do you have for J schools and recruiters in Southern California? How about the support to first gen Latinx college students that can't afford unpaid internships or don't have a high GPA, but have lots of potential? This is a pet cause of the Latino caucus because We also, in when it came to just the big reckoning, we started seeing where our interns coming from. And we have paid interns at the Los Angeles Times, so it's not unpaid internships. MetPro, we have a famous program called MetPro, where it's like a two-year training program that's a little bit higher than an intern, but not a staff writer yet. So we wanted to know where they were coming from. And when it came to the intern program, a lot of them were not from Southern California. And a lot of them were not, you know, people of color. So we pushed both the Black Caucus and the Latino Caucus pushed to make sure that we are represented to get not just the Cal States, but the community college and basically make it, uh, you know, open it up to as many people as possible. So this past uh, our, our summer insurance just got announced. And I think we got people from Dominguez Hills, from Cal State Fullerton. I know we got someone from Cal State Northridge. And it was great. We're excited to, you know, welcome them into that. But I think, uh, you know, the message for the J schools, especially as advisors, press the LA Times. Uh, I remember when um, we had our open house uh, for college students, uh, part of the members of the organizing committee, one of the members, Andrew Campa, he was reaching out to these papers. And that, that was the first thing these uh, advisors said, how can we get our students in? Because we're not getting our students in. And Andrew is, you know, because he's one of our younger reporters, he's like, uh, and th there was not bitterness, but there was more like exasperations. Like, look, we got these amazing students and we can't get them into the times. And we understand how important the times is and how amazing you folks are, but like, help us out here. So we're definitely pushing on that. So uh, Liliana, I do want to say anything quickly to that, Paloma. Uh, no, I think you. I think you got it. I mean, it's just we we see that as a huge issue. I think we asked them for the numbers of how many interns they had from Cal State over the last like several years, and it was some, something like four percent. Um, so it's not okay. We have to change that. We are pushing to change that. We are trying to hold them accountable for changing that um, because you know the idea that journalists can only come from like fancy schools or you know have fancy intern uh, experience. It's just ridiculous. You, we, we don't accept that. We don't think it's okay and we think it has to change. Um, I do think there is an effort to do that um, from uh, our new uh, deputy managing editor of Culture and Talent. Um, I do think there's a real commitment to do that. Ahí vamos. Liliana Lopez asks, ¿Y, y qué hay de los periódicos pequeños que, que recomend, qué recomendación nos dan? Acabo de escribir una carta exponiendo la situación de mi periódico y la mía propia en especial, pero por un lado no sentía que tenía a quién con convocar y por otro tengo la impresión que la mayoría que de que la mayoría de los colegas se, senti se sentirían, perdóname soy pocho, uh, temerosos de hablar abiertamente de sueldos, falta de apoyo, falta de representación, representación etc. Yo lo hice sola y estoy orgullosa de haberlo hecho. Felicidades, tenemos orgullo de usted también. Y es difícil porque una gente tiene miedo, no le importa también. Y por eso yo pienso que es importante empezar con, la, con las colegas que son tus amigos o amigas. Así empezar con la gente que tú sabes que le va a importar, aunque sea un periódico chico, chico o grande, va a ser la misma cosa. Una gente va a, estar, va a tener miedo, otras no. Y poco a poco agarrar más, más personas a tu causa y hablar de estos problemas. Lo, lo que yo he encontrado es, lo que yo he encontrado es que, we have less than two minutes, so va a ser la última pregunta. Uh, lo que yo he encontrado es que con número, con, ¿cómo se dice? Antes dice la organización Mecha. La unión hace la fuerza. Entonces, agarrar más gente que está con tu causa y poco a poco hacerlo. Y si vas a, vas a hacer tú sola, pues tú sola lo tienes que hacer. En inglés hay un dicho, heavy lies the crown, que la corona pesa mucho. Así es la cosa. 
and I think that's it. Uh, okay, final okay. thing, uh, final thing, folks. Again, si, si quieren hablar con nosotros, uh, agarren, uh, mándenos correo electrónicos, gustavo.arellano arroba latimes.com paloma.esquivel arroba latimes.com Follow us, folks, on LAT uh, Latino Caucus. Find us on social media, Twitter. And again, if you folks, anyone wants to create something like a Latino Caucus, please, please, please reach us out. Me and Paloma, we are more than happy to help in whatever way possible. Paloma, final word. Yeah, no, I think that's it. Reach out to us. Let us know how we can help. Um, we, we definitely want to do that. So, and thank you everybody for, for listening to us. And here comes all the Slack messages from work. So thank you again, folks. Right on time. <laughs> Bye. Adios.